uh, welcome again. Uh, I see many of the same faces that were here in the morning, but there might be some newcomers. Uh, but for those of you who are not here in the morning, uh, you missed out of a good discussion. Uh, and also a presentation that I think was very, um, uh, was a good bridge basically to the next seminar. Uh, in the morning we discussed how, how can we define or how can we separate the religious from the secular? How can we say that some are religious actors while others are secular actors? Uh, in this uh, presentation, um, we have three political scientists who share um, common methodology in the way that they use both empirical and quantitative methods uh, in their approach of, uh, of study. Um, they also share a keen interest in, in um, making research relevant. Uh, and uh, I hope that after the presentations that we will continue the discussion of the morning and expand on it. Um, let me see. We ask some very big questions uh, today. And one of the reasons why we can do it is because of your methodology, because you, through that, you are able to kind of give that bird's view perspective of some of these global trends, and uh, which I think is extremely helpful uh, for people with particular knowledge of one case or institution or tradition, and then to, to try and link it up and see where does it fit, where does it not fit, and so on. Uh, we ask the questions, how can religious war be understood? Uh, are conflicts involving, involving religious dimensions particularly horrid? And how can religious uh, conflicts be solved? Uh, my name is Gina Lende, and I'm a researcher at PRIO, and I will chair this event. Uh, what we will do is we will have a small marathon of presentations. Uh, first, uh, Monica will talk for 35 minutes, then Isaac for 35 minutes approximately, mm -hmm. and then Ranghel uh, for approximately 20 minutes in the end. Then we will all need a small break, so we'll get coffee and stuff, and then 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll uh, ask Scott, uh, my colleague uh, Scott Gates, to, to give his comments, and then we'll have a, a good discussion, hopefully, at the end. So that's the scheme. Okay, first I'd like to, to introduce uh, Monica Duffy-Toft. Uh, we're extremely proud uh, to have, uh, have you here today and to actually have two world leading experts on these topics uh, at PRIO. Uh, Monica is a professor of political science uh, currently at Oxford, mm -hmm. but uh, she's been um, at Harvard Kennedy mm -hmm. School for the last 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, where she, among other things, was the director of the Initiative for Religion in International Affairs. And she is also the co-author of a very acclaimed book. Uh, I brought mine copy today, actually, <laughs> in case some of you would like to just uh, look, uh, look into it, uh, which she co-wrote with Daniel uh, Philpott and Timothy Shaw. Mm -hmm. uh, it's here in case you would like to have a look. Uh, talking about publications, one thing before I forget it. Many of you <laughs> asked me about a reference for the article that Gunning talked about. Uh, if you have your notes, uh, I'll tell you where you can find it. It is in Critical Studies of Terrorism. That's the name of the journal. Volume 4, number 3, published in December 2011. OK. okay uh, first, Monica, sure. please. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to be talking to you about um, uh, religion and insurgency in the Caucasus. But before I do that, as Gina or Gina said, I was at the Kennedy School for 10 years at Harvard, which is the School of Public Policy. I've now joined the University of Oxford, where they've stood up, where we're standing up right now, a new School of Public Policy. So if there are any undergraduates here, if there are any researchers here, um, uh, this is a very practical, practice-oriented School of Public Policy. Uh, this year we have 38 students, next year we're going to have 60, then 120. It's a one year long program. Uh, students get um, economics, political science, 
science and technology policy, health policy, uh, very broad, but in some cases very in depth. Uh, so if you're interested, email me, uh, or you can take, I have one brochure with me, you can take that with you. Um, it's really terrific, and uh, again, it's a one-year program, Masters of Public Policy, University of Oxford, and we actually are now in the process of creating a PhD program, so if any of you more junior people are thinking about getting a PhD, consider coming to the Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford. Uh, it's a pretty exciting venture to stand up a new school in a university that's 900 years old. It's sort of dissonant, and our building is really quite <coughs> Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about religion and insurgency in the Caucasus. It's a region in the, of the world, I should I admit this, that I have been following probably all of my life. I remember when I was an eight-year-old kid in elementary school and I had to draw pictures of uh, Red Square and Basil's you know, chapel or cathedral. And so the Soviet Union had, and, and the Russian Empire and now of course the Russian Federation had always um, uh, sort of intrigued me. Uh, maybe it was like Churchill, it was an enigma to me. Um, and in my first book, I spent a lot of my time looking at the Caucasus for my case study. So my first book was on the geography of ethnic violence, looking at settlement patterns and whether it matters if groups are minorities, majorities. But in that book, I didn't differentiate different kinds of ethnicities. So in the earlier conversation, it came up how Scott Appleby thinks it may be futile uh, for us to differentiate different kinds of traits that might make up ethnicity. So we can think about language, race, culture, uh, of course religion um, is one of them. And so in that first book, I didn't differentiate, but I was working on the Caucasus and Chechnya. And as you know, if anybody's familiar with the history of the region, the first war was absolutely a national separatist war. I can say that with 99% confidence. Somebody who you know, might come through and say, no, 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 there's some religion there. Uh, but it was really about national separatism and the degree to which uh, Moscow was going to give them greater autonomy, and then eventually they started demanding outright independence. And after that first war, or the Chechens would say the latest iteration of conflict in that region happened from 94 to 96, there was a, a ceasefire that was settled uh, between uh, Grozny uh, and Moscow, and from 96 to 99, there was, I don't even want to call it peace, but there was a ceasefire in place. Uh, lots of hooliganism, banditry, stealing of oil and everything else. And you started seeing Islamists. You actually did start seeing both uh, Wahhabis coming from the region, not a tremendous number of them. There is evidence that some did come. Um, and greater influence of religion in the region. This is not to say that religion was absent in the 94 to 96 war, but it really was a nationalist struggle. Think about Moscow as having been an empire and the Chechen as the colonized, and they really wanted to throw it off. By the second time, from 96 to 99, what you start, started seeing at the locality and the more localized politics within Chechnya is the political elite sort of, I don't want to say playing the game, but allowing and actually pushing religion into the political arena much more. And so Dudayev, I'm going to show you guys some pictures in a bit, he was absolutely, we talked about secularism, the guy was an Air Force general in the Soviet Air Force, right? Uh, but then by 99, there really was this struggle and what you could see is sort of the Islamization of the region. And so the question is why, why did this happen? What were the, how did it relate to sort of what was going on globally and that sort of thing? So this project is, is sort of trying to get at that. It's my next book, which I have no idea when I'm gonna finish it since I'm you know, so busy standing up with school. Um, this paper in particular is co-authored with Yuri Zhukov. Uh, we actually have a paper coming out on um, uh, that's using a very the, the same data but answering a different question just on whether it's better to contain or punish um, insurgents. We don't look at religion there. Uh, so Yuri and I are co-conspirators in this project. Uh, this is largely an empirical exercise. I joke that I'm a barefoot empiricist. Uh, it always bothers me when people start talking about something yet they haven't established the baseline. And so my question for this is really where is religion in the mix of of ethnicity uh, or ethnic politics within the Caucasus and trying to get that uh, and pull that out. Again, the Russian Federation, the Caucasus region is only one case. I'm also looking at Iran. And so the, how is it that Ayatollah Khomeini and the mullahs and the Ayatollahs that supported him were able to sort of Islamicize Iranian politics? This was new. Shiism was sort of, we talk about pacifist, quietist Shiism. 
Um, but in the 1960s, there was a reinterpretation of what it means to be a Shia, and that you actually had an obligation to challenge public authority. And the 1979 revolution was the culmination of that. Looking at Afghanistan as well, which as we know, it was largely secular. There, the Islamists did not have a lot of uh, play. And then Sudan, similar dynamics. The first war, autonomy for the South. Just get Khartoum off our backs. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're uh, not allowing us to develop as much. But then as the, you know, the second war hit, um, and largely because of politics in Khartoum, where you had this guy, Tarabi, uh, allowing for the Islamists to have a greater say in the politics of the state of Sudan, then you saw this Islamization <coughs> campaign. And I don't want to say that it was anti-Christian. It was actually just trying to Islamicize all of Sudan, and now we have two states as a result. Uh, I'm trying to look at non-Arab Muslims. So this morning in the conversation, uh, I'm trying to move away because there's big debates about is this Arab culture or is this really Islam? And so in a way, it's a, it's a helpful to sort of uh, control for that. Um, and then I'm really trying to differentiate nationalist and religious motivations and uncertainty. I have the utmost respect for Scott Appleby. I love his book, um, The Ambivalence of the Sacred. I think it's actually one of the best books ever written about the role of religion in politics and society. Even though it was written prior to 9-11, it's not dated. It's really striking. Uh, but I do think there are differences um, uh, between nationalists and religiously motivated fighters. So the central question for the book is under what conditions I'm mainly looking at Islam. It turns out, if you read God's Century, it turns out if you want to look for religious actors, most of the religious actors are people who are, or whose political behavior is being driven by religion, they're largely Islamist in this day and age. And part of it is the secularized West, and we can talk about that. Um, and then I'm, I'm curious about uh, what kind of violence uh, and what form does the violence take? Does it make a difference? All right, so nationalism and religion. Um, so they share a lot in common. Right, the sort of, if you want to think about Benedict Anderson, the imagined community, right, the idea that Henrik and I, as fellow, actually you're as secular as they come, if I recall, uh, <laughs> atheist maybe even, I don't want to put Henrik on the spot, but, but the point is, is that somehow down the line, you know, we may, if we're fellow Christians, we believe that we share some sort of common descent or something uh, in that way, uh, and, and sort of a common history and a common culture. Um, a critical, so, so there's a lot in common with nationalism and religion, the idea of community, sets of beliefs, sets of traditions, practices coming together. Um, but one of the critical differences is that whereas an, when a nationalist dies, a nationalist dies for the good of the nation, right? It really is self-sacrifice. There's no rewards at the end of it. Whereas when a religious adherent dies, not only are they perpetuating the religious community, they're hoping to. But for many traditions, and here I'm talking about Abrahamic traditions, I'm not talking about Buddhism and Confucianism, there's an idea of self-salvation, right? So the self-sacrifice is not only for the group ends, it's part of that, but it's also that they're gonna get something at the end of it, that the, the sacrifice uh, is actually gonna benefit them as they believe it's going to benefit them as it. That's a very important distinction, because when you read some of the, you know, you read the notes for why some of the people do the behaviors that they do, uh, they believe that it's for God's will, and that God wanted them, wanted them to do it, and that they're gonna be rewarded for it. Nationalists don't believe that, actually. For them, it's enough that the nation is gonna be, that they have an obligation to keep the nation going. Another is that nationalists, it doesn't, territoriality isn't as big an issue in the sense that for a true church, a true community, it's where fellow worshipers are, right? So when you talk to somebody about the Catholic Church, the Pope, why does the Pope travel around the world? Well, because he's going, he's visiting church members. So religion isn't as localized as nationalists are. So in my first book, I talked about ethnically based or nationalist wars. They're largely defensive and local. We know what territory now they're going to fight over. Yes, it may be contained within a particular space. And if you look at maps, you know, you look at a lot of these maps, they bring them out. The Hungarians, they're always going to show you the maps in the 19th century where they had the biggest sweep and control of land. But we know it's contained within that part of Europe. That's where the Hungarians are fighting. That's not the case for religious adherents. They, they're much more um, sort of transnational. And it would, in these day and age, we say global. Um, uh, religion allows a little bit more for conversion. You don't necessarily have to be born a Serb or a Croat or an Irishman. Um, and then the critical thing is God is the ultimate arbiter. And that if you really believe that this is God's will, um, and, and it's about beliefs here, then, um, then you 
believe you're doing the right thing, and God is going to be the ultimate arbiter. Uh, so I do think that, so contrary to Appleby, I do think that there are critical differences and that this will have implications. So one implication, if you think about wars, um, is that nationalist wars, it seems to me, are, are going to be less likely to spill over or to invite outsiders to come in, um, um, that sort of thing. So again, I'm looking at Islamist focus. Isaac has actually done some more research right here. I'm just talking about the data that I presented in an IS article that got published in 2007, uh, nine out of 10 intra-religious civil wars, so that's wars fighting you know, uh, brother against brothers between Muslims, and then two thirds of them involved um, at least one side with Muslims. So we've talked about uh, Nigeria this morning where you've got Christians and Muslims going at it. Um, terrorism, before, and this is based on Bruce Hoffman, prior to 1981, Bruce Hoffman has a great book called Inside Terrorism. Again, it's a classic in the field. Um, that prior to the 1980s, we just did not see religiously inspired terrorism. It just didn't exist. It was class-based. We talked about the, the Bader meinhof groups in Germany, the Red, Red Brigades. Um, that changed after the 1980s, uh, that you just start seeing religion becoming much more of a focal point. Some people trace it to the 1967 war. You, you, again, the, in the book, we talk about important critical events that brought religion to the fore. The 67 war, the failure of secular ideologies to deliver the goods to many populations of the world. So you had decolonization in the 40s and the 50s, continuing in the 60s, and local elites, you know, who, many of whom adopted <coughs> communism, socialism, liberal capitalism, or variants thereof, they were not able to get these states to provide the basic needs, shelter, food, medical care, education, whatever it may be. Religious authorities were there. They still had their legitimacy. The beliefs, the traditions, the values were still there. And so they were turned to, religious elites were turned to, or they sort of mobilized their populations. And by the way, not always for ill. In many uh, corners of the world, religious actors were not violent. In fact, most they, in most cases, they were not. And we have data about democratization that religious actors uh, were politically, politically involved and engaged. And a lot of times, it was for the betterment of society, not necessarily tearing down political institutions. Um, but the critical point is that religious actors, after the 1980s in particular, and especially when it comes to violence, you see religiously inspired violence much more so. And then since 2004, if you look, the South Mahogadam has tracked this, um, upwards of 90 to 95 percent of all jihadist suicide missions are perpetrated by Salafi jihadists. There's exceptions. We can talk about Sri Lanka, um, but generally speaking, Salafi jihadists do it. So if we think about different types of religious violence, uh, which is what we're doing in this project in the Caucasus, and, and thinking about it, of course, in broader cases, we could talk about Sudan, we could talk about Hamas. Uh, there are still national separate, separatists. So within Chechnya, if you ask me, I'd say Basayev, one of the, the critical actors in the Caucasus, started out as a national separatist, and then became more of a committed Wahhabist. And the question is why? Is it that he fundamentally believed this? Is it because he thought he could get resources, he could expand his organizational base, or a combination thereof? Uh, another is the jihadis, the idea that you know there's this far enemy, and I, as a fellow uh, uh, Muslim, <coughs> need to go and defend um, my my ethnic, my religious brethren across the borders. Uh, so this would be sort of the Al Qaeda offshoots who are sending and shooting out fighters um, and recruiting them to go. Um, beyond their homelands. And then the last are revolutionaries, and Thomas Hayhaber, who's wrote, written a great book on um, jihad in Saudi Arabia, talks about these guys as moral vigilantes. These are the guys, and they tend to be guys who are throwing acid in women's faces, right? So we're seeing this in Afghanistan, and what they're trying to do is correct moral behavior. Uh, and who they really see as sort of the enemy are the near fellow Muslims who are not abiding by a strict interpretation their, their strict interpretation of what it means to be a fellow Muslim. From an international relations perspective, we're not as concerned about those guys, right? Because they're doing their own policing in the neighborhoods. The other two we are concerned because in the first case, these national separatists, they can break up states, Soviet Union. Uh, in the second case, you can have the far enemy can be us. Uh, so I think that the type of religiously inspired violence or motivation uh, matters to the kind of violence that you get. Uh, so nationalist separatists, they're going to go after the local occupier, Moscow. 
ethnic Russians. That's who they're going to go after, the police, the security forces, the army, DOD, border troops, that sort of thing. Uh, Pan-Islamic, they're going to attack Western as well as Muslim transgressors in the region. And then, as I said, the revolutionary, these are the vigilantes, they're going to attack fellow Muslims, right? They're going to go into liquor stores and bomb, um, throw gas, you know, bottles, you know, fire, sort of like Molotov cocktails, Russian, uh, through uh, windows of bars and stuff. So in this paper, how, if at all, does religion shape the dynamics of insurgency? So we're looking at insurgency from 2000 to 2012. Do Islamist insurgents fight differently? Uh, do they actually use different target sets? Um, um, and uh, who do they attack? And then do Islamists uh, select different types of targets, use different military strategies, and then respond to different types of incentives? So the paper that's coming out in JCR, we're actually going to apply the different counterinsurgency strategies that governments <coughs> use, and I'm presenting some of the preliminary data here, to see if it's the case that when Russia goes in, do Islamists respond differently than non-Islamists and in particular nationalists? And it turns out they do. Um, so if you want to think about the literature, here's where my political science, black, white, you know, comes, no gray. Um, there, people talk about the global and the local dimensions of Islamist violence. So a globalized insurgency is characterized by, um, um, you know, fighters not recognizing borders. Right, that they, it's transnational, that they're willing to go and fight anywhere where they feel as if their fellow Muslims are um, uh, being targeted. Whereas a localized one is its local conditions, its grievances, and if the government just did a better job of service delivery in, the, in their broadest terms, um, then um, you wouldn't have uh, the same amount of violence. And Bob Pape makes the strongest argument. I remember when this APSR article came out and he totally denies religion matters at all. So that really made me angry. I don't know if anybody else who studied, because I think he's partially right, but I think he overstates his case, like a good political scientist does. Um, and, uh, and because I look at the caucuses and I actually see that the, the dynamics are more complex than that. Um, and then the other framework, all violence is global or more global, uh, Saab Mahagadam does a really nice job teasing out this argument. And basically, he wrote a fantastic critique of Pape, showing how Pape was right up until 2001, but with this reinterpretation of jihad as an obligation for people to go beyond their borders, he sort of misses the boat. And when Pape wrote the APSR article, he didn't have even al-Qaeda in there. I don't know if you know, people remember that. In his book, he stuck it in there, and it does sort of seem like a wart or a gargoyle. He, he, he does have actually a hard time dealing with um, al-Qaeda and its offshoots. So this is sort of how we were setting up this project. Is <coughs> violence global or is it local? And then what, it, what does it mean? Because if it's local, it's going to be more nationalist and homeland oriented. If it's more global, then we think it's going to be more religious, moral obligation, that sort of thing. So again, we're looking at the North Caucasus. Our data cover the entire region of the North Caucasus, not just Chechnya. And so the question is, does Grozny and, and Chechnya is responsible for most of the violence? But as the war and as the conflict spread, it started moving into Dagestan. Of course, uh, Ossetia and Ingushetia had violence, but we're now starting to see the violence spreading out into the broader region. And in fact, now Tatarstan, I don't know if anybody follows politics, but a moderate imam in Pakistan was just taken out and so was his aid. And so it's spreading up actually deeper into Russia. And the question is, is are these one-off instances or is this part of a pattern? So Yuri and I are trying to get at that. The key personalities, there's one guy who's not on here, I'll explain in a second. So we all know who he is, Mr. Boris Yeltsin. So he was the president at the end of the Soviet Union who challenged Gorbachev and basically told the republics to take as much power as they could in a power play to weaken Gorbachev, which he did, but then he ended up weakening uh, the Russian Federation such that you had regions like Chechnya saying, okay, Boris, he told us to do it, we're doing it. Um, he was, uh, he hand selected this guy Putin, former KGB guy. Putin, of course, is still in power, has since been elected, but of course, really, he was hand selected and been ratified. I mean, I, I personally don't think there's been three elections there yet. Um, the guy here on the, this is um, um, Jogart Dudayev. 
He was the leader of Chechnya in the late 80s and then into the 90s, who brought Chechnya into the fight with Moscow by declaring independence of the republic. Um, he was killed on the battlefield, and to me that's a pretty good indicator that he was a committed nationalist. He was on a satellite phone and he, a missile took him out. He was replaced, so he got killed uh, in the conflict. Uh, Basayev and, uh, uh, actually ran, against president, ran for president against him, came in second, um, and then sort of stepped out of the political um, 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 uh, politics for a while, then Mashadov came into power. Uh, again, Basayev ran, did not win. And so it was when Basayev, after losing to Mashadov, um, uh, really started upping the Islamist credentials and really started becoming quite extremist and made it very difficult for Masada because you understand Masada was trying to tell Moscow that I've got this Islamist problem in the region and Moscow wasn't doing him any favors because Moscow refused to talk to this guy. Then you have Masada who there's no picture here because he didn't last long. What did Moscow do to Masada? Killed him too, right? So kill him. Then they killed a, a more moderate, another less moderate than him, but more moderate than him. Uh, and this guy starts aligning himself with real Wahhabis, right? Uh, and you can see the beards are getting longer. And so now we're stuck with this guy, Doku Umarov, who really, he sees himself as sort of the emir of a caucus emirate, and he is committed to doing that now. So here we are today, 2012, and he's a pretty angry guy, and he really is committed. Now Moscow, Putin, with Putin pretty much, has installed this guy Kadyrov, um, who has basically put an iron fist on the republic. It's pretty much run like an autocratic place. Yes, there's been rebuilding and reconstruction, but the violence is still occurring, in particular against um, uh, security forces. Uh, and so those are the key personalities. But the point is, is that this guy, I, you know, just look at his dress. I mean, he really was a moderate secular guy. Moscow probably now is kicking itself, thinking we should have talked to him. They refuse because Ma Yeltsin said, if I talk to him, then he's my equal. And I refuse to recognize him as an equal. And then since then, has tried to assassinate every single one of them on out. Um, all right, so that's the broad overview. So there does seem to be sort of an Islamization of the politics of the region with outside forces coming in. So Basayev uh, allied himself with this guy, Fatab, and uh, they moved into Dagestan, and some people think that they were responsible for the Moscow city bombings. I don't know if you remember that in 1999, which sort of supercharged charged Putin's career and allowed for Moscow to go back down in the region. That was Basayev, this guy here, who did that, um, this guy here. In alignment with that, we don't know what Hattab is. We don't know if he's Saudi or Jordanian. Um, well, anyway, so the North Caucasus, so lots of different regions, lots of violence across a long period of time. Um, and uh, different policies in the different republics. Some of the leaders who've come in have tried to take a softer hand and some have tried to take a harder hand. Um, and uh, from Moscow's perspective, they really have been selling it as a battlefield of the global war on terror or a global jihad. Uh, and so we question that, is it? To what extent? How many Arabs have been there? Uh, that sort of thing. Um, or is it the case that it still is largely based in local grievances or how are local grievances playing out? So we look at data that includes all episodes of violence reported from 2000 to 2012. We'd love to have data from 1900, 1990 to 2000, but Memorial, which is a human rights organization, Jay Lyle used some of these data, but only for the caucuses. And for an hour question, we're looking at all of the data. Um, so there's over 7,200 villages and 31,000 reported episodes of violence. This is all kinds of violence, by the way. Um, and, uh, and then we know who initiated the violence and then uh, whether it was the government, the rebels. And we also know who the rebels were because in many cases they take credit for it. Um, and so we ended up geo, uh, um, uh, uh, coding all of these different reports to create a data set and then geocoded them to see about sort of this contagion, contagion effect, um, this spreading out. Because if it's more nationalist, then we would expect the violence to not spread as much, but if it's Islamist, then we would expect it to spread a little bit more. Uh, so these are the villages throughout the entire region. So you can see there's a lot of them, there's 70, almost 7,300. For us, an Islamist, so it's, we're looking at Islamist violence. We also sort of code for nationalist violence. So if somebody <coughs> says they're fighting for, as part of the Chechen brigades, and sometimes they, they make those claims. 
Um, and um, uh, so it has to be somebody who's Salafist, Mohajed, uh, Wahhabist, um, and then looking at the kind of attack that they're doing and then why. And a lot of times they'll say, we have these great reports where the guy will say, they'll stand up there in front of a liquor store and they announce, you know, we are doing this for Allah because you guys are transgressors, and then they'll throw the bomb. And then the security police come, they arrest them, they get interrogated, tortured, and don't see their families again. But, um, but the point is, is that these reports have lots and lots of information in them. Um, and then the village, we code, it's an event data, data set. Uh, if it has one episode of violence in a month, and most only have one. Um, it's not like one village, or like Rosny, um, obviously, and we do control for capitals. Um, so here's the key findings. I mean, uh, we're looking at the relative share of violence across this period, uh, the geographic scope, the targeting. Again, these are sort of the propositions that we started with. Is it the case that Islamist violence is different than nationalist, right? Um, refugee camps, the idea is, is that, you know, people say that they're hot spots or, or of, of insurgency. Um, and then the local history and injustice, we would expect that, you know, populations that are deported, nationalists, Chechens were deported, you know, during the Stalin era. Uh, would it be, would that matter? Whereas if you're an Islamist, Islamists weren't targeted during the Stalin era. It was Chechens, it was the nations that were targeted. And then the prediction and, and, uh, which ones are more difficult to predict, um, and then the timing of it. Does it happen immediately, um, and that sort of thing. And so just to give you a sense, I'll go through each of these findings. Um, as a proportion, when we first, this is just a straight you know, number of counts, I was really surprised how low Islamist violence was. Because Moscow, really, they, they're, they're, they want to make it out that there's tons and tons of Islamist violence. But it, in any period, it's no more than 19%. So even in the height of this, in the 2006-2007 period, only 19%, one in five episodes, can we actually say for sure it was Islamist violence. So the proportion of violence that we can really attribute to Islamists ranges from 3% to 19% over the total period. Most of it largely still is nationalists. So people who say that I'm, I'm doing this for Chechnya, I'm doing this for Ingushetia, I'm doing this to fight for the Prigorodny region, which is a contested region. Um, and so you can see, I was really shocked. I actually thought when we, we, we looked at the counts, it would be much higher than that. However, you can see that the proportion, you know, as this chart says, that it is small, but it has been increasing. And just like we know from uh, uh, Isaac's work and my work and Ragan Hill's work, that it tends to be more lethal. Now, part of the reason for that is that is Islamists, in this case, they tend to go after soft targets, right? And so they're not necessarily always going after security forces the way nationalists are. Uh, so that's consistent with the broader data on civil wars and, and actually suicide terrorism. Mahagano makes the case that uh, Salafi terrorism is more lethal um, and, and accounts for greater casualties than non-Salafists. Um, so that's that. Then the geographic scope. So then here, this is the data on um, the degree of fatality. So religiously inspired attacks result in higher levels of fatality than non-religious. And again, I think that's because of the targeting, um, that they go after softer targets. If you look at this, Islamist attacks, they're more indiscriminate, meaning that more civilians, non-combatants, die as a result of the religiously inspired um, uh, violence. And so this is the, this is the, Lord, the most expansive definition this is the most restrictive, but you can see that across all the different um, definitions, that Islamists tend to be less discriminate when they go after targets. Uh, that there does, and what I would say, and I think Appleby would agree with me on here, that there's a symbolic element to this, right? I think one of the differences with religiously inspired terrorism that sort of makes us all uneasy is that um, they don't mind killing people anymore. In the old days, it really was to put pressure with the Badr Meinhof group and and those sorts of organizations, it really was to put pressure on government, right? They didn't want to kill lots of people. The Irish, you know, the IRA wasn't into killing lots of people. They knew that the hammer was going to come down that much harder. But this is sort of evidence to the idea that, no, actually, you know, when bin Laden says he wants to kill three million Americans, which is in some of his, you know, declared statements, I think he really does mean it. Um, and then if you look at the dispersion, it turns out that, um, uh, the 
uh, Islamist violence <coughs> is indeed more dispersed. And how we did this is that if there's a village here that has Islamist violence, where is the next episode of violence happening? And so what happens is Moscow comes in, it clamps down, it does a road closure, and we have data on road closures and all of that. Whereas the nationalists, they do seem to stay more contained uh, within uh, particular regions. So again, this is consistent with the idea that nationalists tend to be defensive. They have more localized territory over which they're fighting. Whereas Islamists, they're willing to go where they need to in order to, to make their attacks. Um, then the question is, is global, this is sort of trying to adjudicate between Mahogadam and Pape, the degree to which um, this is a global fight. So Asaf makes a very strong claim that there's a lot of learning going on in the interstate system or the international system and that global jihadists are watching each other. And so Yuri and I tracked these data against uh, Assaf's data, and it turns out that Islamists, there does seem to be a tracking, and it's statistically significant, um, to global suicide events. So there does, again, seem to be sort of an inspiration. It's not a really strong uh, relationship, but it is there, statistically significant, that if there's a, a global suicide attack somewhere, then in Chechnya and the Caucasus more broadly, uh, there seems to be a matching against the Islamist attacks in that region as well, and not so much against the nationalists. Um, and then the Islamist violence, this is the argument about um, uh, how do they respond to government counterinsurgency operations. And it turns out, so these are preliminary, we're still running um, a lot of the data, and this is just looking at counterinsurgency operations, not the type of operation. So you can think about the government and going in and punishing an individual. So Scott, we know you did it, we pull him out. Or knowing that this table, somebody at this table did it, so we're gonna cordon off this table. And Moscow does both, and, some, and sometimes it only does one, sometimes, so we're looking at that. But the critical point about this is that when an Islamist is counterattacked, they get really pissed off. And so they react much more quickly. It dies off. The good news is that if in Moscow where the Russian forces don't get attacked within 30 days, chances are they're not gonna get attacked. And we looked at six months out, it dissipates. The, the counteractivity dissipates pretty quickly. But the point is, is that it seems to be more effective against nationalists, but you can see even nationalists get pissed off. So this lends support to people who are experts on insurgency and counterinsurgency that you're creating more hostility and you're creating more insurgents. And this seemed, the magnitude is, is much higher for the Islamists. So there seems to be truth for this. And I think we're the first ones to actually be able to show this uh, with any degree of confidence. All right, so I'm concluding. I don't even know where, where I am at time. Oh, look at that, perfect. Um, so not all religious violence is local. You know, the targeting or the mapping with the global jihadists, that there does seem to be a relationship. I don't want to overstate it or overplay it, but there does seem to be some evidence that there's an aspiration or, or a mimicking of what's happening. Um, but most of it is local. And what you know, we want to say you know, to governments, to the US government as it continues operation in Afghanistan, Iraq, I think we're going to see some heating up again, uh, that local politics matters so much more and the local dynamics. Uh, and so the grievances you know, really need to be taken into consideration for the governments that are doing it and that they have control. And so what we're hoping in the next iteration of this paper is to show that denial, it turns out if you want to know what's the best strategy against counterinsurgents, um, punishment's the worst. Going in and, and you know, humiliating, shaming, and punishing an individual is much worse than cordoning off an area where you're going after a group. And better than that is doing nothing, right? A better strategy is the government to sort of sit back, the anger dissipates. And so if you're interested in that in general terms, not against religious and nationalists, um, government does have the choice not to respond. And um, you know, we can talk about that, uh, given the ways in which different governments, and Norway too, has responded to terrorism, uh, that sometimes it maybe it is you step back, take a deep breath, and let things simmer. And the evidence seems to be that in this region, at least, that's a better strategy than punishing. Um, <coughs> denial works, but it has to be done really effectively. So I'm going to end it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Monica. Uh, 
must say that Monica, for those of you who were here in the morning, and Monica, you came in at around 11, so you missed the, the first presentation, but... Um, I caught the tail end of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I'm already looking forward to the discussions <laughs> because uh, there are some uh, different views, uh, which I think is, uh, yeah, m uh, promises for a, a healthy debate. Okay, our next presenter is Isak Svensson. He's uh, an associate professor at the Department of Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Uppsala. His main focus has been on religious dimensions of peace and conflict processes. Uh, you've also had a keen interest in international mediation uh, and worked particularly, particularly on Asia. And I also saw in your long publication list uh, that you have also done some research on the Norwegian role as a mediator uh, in the case of Sri Lanka, but also elsewhere. So, uh, really looking forward to the presentation. Thank you. Excellent. All right, so, uh, first of all, thank you very much for... Can you hear me now? Yeah, all right, okay, you can hear me. All right, let's start. So, thank you very much for the invitation to come here. Thanks, the organizers. Thank uh, Nina and, and uh, Reinhild for organizing this uh, extremely interesting event. I also must say that I'm, I'm very humbled to be here with, with Ragnhild and Monica and also uh, Iselin Frydenlund, scholars that, are, uh, that have been very influential in my own thinking and that I'm very impressed by the research that you have, have done. <coughs> uh, uh, I also want to emphasize the, the, the link between PRIO and Uppsala. It's very good to be uh, here at, at PRIO, coming from the Department of Peace and Conflict Research at the Uppsala University. My take on this is, is from a, uh, the perspective of a peace scholar uh, in, in, the, uh, in the tradition of empirical peace research. So you will see some differences with Professor Gunning. <coughs> I'm, I'm from the tradition of empirical peace research. Uh, uh, and and that's, uh, you will see some, some, some differences to the, the morning session for those, that, uh, those of you who were here. And I think there will be a healthy uh, di disagreement and debate that we could engage with after the coffee in in a very peaceful way, of course. <laughs> so uh, um, my title, uh, my presentation is called "Ending Holy Wars: Religion and Conflict Resolution," uh, and I've been doing this when I've been in, based in New Zealand for the last three years, and uh, it's basically uh, uh, focused on a book that is coming out in just uh, in the coming weeks from University of Queensland Press in Australia. So this is a commercial break before we, we start. Uh, uh, and just for two weeks ago, I, I came back from, from uh, Manila in the Philippines. And for those of us who are interested in the question about religion and conflict, uh, the Philippines and the ongoing process that uh, events that is going on there is extremely fascinating. And I want to start with making three uh, sort of empirical observations drawn from the Philippine case. I'm not a, a, an expert on, on the Philippine case. I was just there and, and visited. But it, it's still an extremely interesting case to, to, to look at uh, because it reveals something of general pattern, something of a general nature. So there are three, three points, basically. And the first point I think we have been discussing throughout the day here. And that is that religion tends to come in late in the conflict dynamics. So if you look at the, the, the conflict in, um, uh, over Mindanao, you can see that the first conflict was fought by a, a, a rebel group called MNLF, uh, um, Moro National Liberation Front. Uh, Later came in a, a group that bro broke away that was called Moro Islamic Liberation Front. And then the last decade you have an, 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 a group called ASG, uh, which was uh, even more on the extreme of the religious, on the religious dimension. Uh, and as we have talked about in, in, in the case of Israel-Palestine, as we have uh, shown very convincingly in, uh, in the last presentation by Monica, we can see that uh, the general pattern is that we, we, we see conflict starting with sort of nationalist or leftist ideologies and religion coming in at the later stage. 
that of course has to do with shifts in global, the, the global, the end of the Cold War, the global dynamics, the shifting ideolo ideological landscape that we were discussing this morning. It also has to do with escalation of demands. So that religion uh, is a form of, of escalations of, of demands. Um, so the religious issues uh, come in late. Uh, I think that's a, a very important uh, observation. Uh, the second uh, um, point I want to make is that religious issues are one among several issues. Religious issues are one among several issues. And here, I would, here I'm, I'm, I'm taking a little bit of, of, of issue then with, with, a, with a very good presentation by uh, uh, Professor Gunning, um, who was uh, uh, extremely convincing in many ways, and I do agree on, on uh, most points. But there, this, I have a different take on this whole idea about the sort of abolishing the dichotomy between secular and religious. I don't think that's a, 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 a fruitful way to go. I think we need to look at it as more of a sort of uh, a open, open empirical question and see whether there are religious dimensions and what those di religious dimensions are and be explicit with what those religious dimensions are. And in my work, I've, I've been thinking about three dimensions of how religion plays out in, in conflicts. Uh, the first one is that, um, uh, and the most important, is what I call a religious dimension in the incompatibility. Incompatibility is at the core of conflict. That's the issue, what, 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 what the conflict is about. Note, it's not about the causes of conflict, which is something else but the aspirations that the parties have. If we look at the explicit aspirations of the parties, we can discern whether the, some of the sides are de demanding something that has to do with religion. Uh, uh, and I have done that. Um, uh, this is the more Islamic liberation front I uh, started with. Uh, and I've, I just want to clarify the, the, the basic here is religious incompatibility. That does not mean that the whole incompatibility is just about about religion. And if you look at the, the explicit aspirations of groups and of states in relation to, uh, to, to conflicts, <clears throat> they, uh, religion is just one among several factors. I would argue that uh, maybe uh, Al-Qaeda be an exception, but even, even Al-Qaeda, if you look at the demands, there are a set of demands. Some of them are religious and some of them are political. But there is a religious dimension in the incompatibility. There is something about uh, the, 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 uh, the laws that would, that, that would govern the country if they should be anchored in in a religious tradition, for instance. That means that there is a, a, a disagreement over the role of religion in conflict. Uh, so the, the, to, to go back to the, to the, to the case of uh, MILF in, in the Philippines, you could see that, yes, this is a, a religious conflict in the sense that it has a religious in dimension in the incompatibility. But it's not the most important dimension. It's rather peripheral. There are several other uh, political aspirations from that group. But the religious issue is there. Uh, and it is important. Uh, it, and it is also important for the, the whole problem of how to resolve this conflict. So uh, um, I, my position on this is that you, you sort of, we need to uh, find ways of sort of operationalizing and measuring and, and capture, empirically capturing uh, uh, the religious dimension in, in some uh, meaningful way. Uh, and what, what this basically shows, uh, um, you will be familiar with the overall curve if, if you are uh, into uh, 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 
empirical data on, on armed conflict. This is the general distribution of, of armed conflict over time since 1975 up to 2009. Uh, and, and the general trend we can see is that, that before 1979, basically, you had very little um, conflicts where one other side made explicit reference to religion in their stated aspirations. And then you had a slow growth uh, up to the beginning of the 90s. And after that, you have basically have a, a question of sort of a, a rather robust sort of uh, frequency over time. Uh, uh, interesting to, to see is that the proportion basically is, is changing because the other conflicts are uh, as, as sort of is, is well known at this stage, are decreasing over time. Religious conflict, religious conflict in, in the sense of religious dimension in the co incompatibility, are not decreasing in the same manner. So there is something that, that, that uh, in here that shows that um, uh, religious conflicts are difficult to, to resolve. And that's my third point that, that uh, I would take from the my visit to Manila is that if we look at conflicts and we compare different conflicts to each other, we can say that religious, those that are, have a religious dimension in the incompatibility are more difficult to resolve. But that does not mean that it's not possible. So it's difficult, but it is still possible. And the, the Philippine case, I think, illustrates that in, in, in a nice way. We had an agreement with the um, not we, but there was an agreement with the, the, the Nationalist Liberation Front, the Moral National Liberation Front, already in 1976. And then a, a sort of an agreement, then the implementation of that uh, agreement was very um, controversial, and there was a lot of controversy around that. And you had a sort of an agreement, the Jakarta Agreement, in, in, in 1996. So you had sort of no problems of, of solving that conflict, or sort of less problems of solving that conflict through a negotiated settlement. Uh, but for a long time, we have the difficult thing has been to find a solution to the conflict with a more Islamic front. There has been an ongoing process, but very difficult to find a solution. But then basically on, on uh, 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 but then basically on on, on um, the fifteenth of, of to October this year, you had a, a an fascinating agreement, the agreement over Bank Samaro, which is basically uh, putting out a roadmap or a framework or a formula for a final settlement of this conflict. So it shows that, yes, conflict that has a religious dimension are more difficult to resolve, but they can be resolved. Uh, and this, is, this, uh, this shows, uh, I think, a general pattern. And I will sort of substantiate that. Uh, so in an, in an uh, article that I have published in Journal of uh, uh, Conflict Resolution in uh, uh, 1990, uh, sorry, in, in 2007, uh, I, I make a first sort of effort to try to, to get at this. So looking at data from all conflicts, all internal armed conflicts from 1989 to 2003, on a dyadic level, <clears throat> coding the, whether they have a religious dimension in the incompatibility, uh, I find that overall you would have a sort of a negative effect, a negative effect on the likelihood of negotiated settlements, showing that these are more difficult to resolve. Uh, and I, I put in some controls for the, the uh, for also controlling for the issue of territory, ethnicity, uh, and, and also other sort of uh, contextual uh, contextual variables uh, and still this sort of negative effect of religion is still there as a peace scholar this is interesting but it's not enough of course I mean I, we can't leave it that they're saying that yes these are difficult to resolve so uh, what I've been doing when I was in New Zealand uh, partly I was doing other things as well to be honest but uh, was to, to try to look into what about those exceptions? Are the cases that you were, you were able to, to solve the conflicts 
uh, even though you had a religious dimension in the incompatibility? And how did that uh, sort of that process uh, evolve? Um, yeah, this is a, a sort of a summary of, of, of yeah, just the rare question. I mean, that's also an important point to point out, especially in, in the sort of a, in the, uh, the Scandinavian setting, because there is a lot of misunderstanding about the role of religion. I mean, w when we're talking about uh, religious conflict, they are about 25% of all armed conflict. Uh, so. 75% of, of all conflict do not have a religious dimension in the incompatibility over this time period. Uh, so, um, I mean, if you we talk with someone uh, at the street in Uppsala, they would, uh, they would say that religion is sort of the, the most important factor behind all armed conflict, and that's just not true. Uh, uh, there is a slight increase, there is an increase in portion because the other conflicts are decreasing and, and uh, there is a decreasing chance of, of negotiated settlements. Uh, I've also been looking, being influential, uh, uh, um, influenced by the work of, of Ragnhild, I've been sort of working with this dichotomy between central and peripheral, trying to sort of say, okay, we have a, a religious dimension in, in the incompatibility, can we, can we distinguish those cases where it's just peripheral from where it's more central? That's a, uh, a little bit of a judgment call, and, uh, but there is basically a possibility to, to I think, to, to, to distinguish between these cases. And, uh, and the, the, the overall conclusion from this is just to say that, that, that those that have a central demand is sort of a, a, a increasing uh, over time. Uh, and here you can see the distribution of peace agreements. So, of all the, and these are the, those that have a religious dimension in the incompatibility. So we have 78 with a religious dimension in the incompatibility. 72 of them did not end with a negotiated settlement. So they are the most common cases. Again, indicating that if you have a religious dimension, it's more difficult to resolve them. But there are exceptions, these six cases. And my book tries to look at the, the, these exceptions and um, not having the ambition to, to contribute with, with uh, uh, new primary data on the, in these cases, but try to understand the, the, what I would call the, the, uh, the, the desacralization. And, and these, so I, I'm looking at the, the case of Sudan and Somalia. I'm not looking at the termination now of the conflict, but the, the possibility to solve them through a peace agreement. So the, the case of, of Somalia, there was a peace agreement, but there was no, that peace agreement ended one diet, but you had another, the, the Al-Shabaab breaking out basically, so you had a, a continuation of the conflict. But still, from a conflict resolution perspective, it's fascinating that you had an agreement on, also on the religious issue uh, between two conflicting parties. So that's why it's in there. Um, the Philippines, uh, Mindanao, the 1996 uh, agreement, uh, Nepal, Tajikistan, and the, the uh, Indonesia agreement, where religion was part of the explicit aspirations of one of the sides, but the, and the parties was able to reach a uh, uh, negotiated agreement. Uh, so uh, I'm talking in this book about desacralization of armed conflict. Uh, so the, the process of removing religion from the conflict, uh, and which I define as a political or societal. <clears throat> uh, so I'm, I'm trying to um, work out a, a, some sort of meaningful typology uh, uh, for and trying to classify these kind of uh, agreements. And, and I mean, even though. <laughs> The, the book is, is printed and out, the, there's, uh, or not out, again, but still being printed. I mean, this is still, I, I see this as, as, a, as a work in progress very much. Um, so, uh, but basically I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at whether you reach an agreement on the basis of a sort of a, a fulfillment of relig religious aspirations, or if you've reached agreement on fulfillment of secular aspirations, or both. 
So uh, if, you, if you, you would have sort of a low fulfillment of religious aspirations and high fulfillment of secular aspirations, you would have an agreement where you basically land in a sort of a secular-based constitution. On the other hand, if you would have a sort of a high fulfillment of the religious aspirations, a low fulfillment of the secular aspirations, you would be in sort of a, a religious-based constitution. If you have no, uh, I mean, this is uh, the case of, of, of no agreement, basically. You get the transformation of the conflict in some other way. And here you would have both, basically, high uh, fulfillment of religious aspirations and of the secular aspirations. And here you would find the, the, the solutions of religious federalism and religious autonomy. So, um, sorry, hold on, I, I, I'm getting there, don't worry. Ah, here is the, sorry. So, um, uh, so basically, the, the, the agreements that could be sorted in here is basically the case of Tajikistan. Um, uh, and also, I'm looking at some, some of the, the agreements that was reached basically without an agreement, where you have sort of shifts from, from a, a, a a religious, stated religious aspirations, but you have a sort of a unilateral shift. So you have a sort of a desacralization without, without going through the negotiation table. And there you can include uh, cases such as uh, Iraq and Nepal. Uh, uh, also, amnesties, uh, you have got arrangements around amnesties within the secular constitution. And there you would have uh, Algeria, Egypt, and, and, and Libya. Uh, Cases of religious-based constitutions, I would classify uh, Somalia and Afghanistan there. Uh, and interesting cases, I think, is here, the, the sort of the combination of the religious and secular uh, aspirations. And the Mindanao, then, is, a, is an example of that. Uh, and also Aceh in Indonesia could be an example of that. Uh, and I'm trying to work on, on different uh, Trying to detect the, the the sort of the processes through which uh, this desacralization work, uh, and I mean, and this is basically trying to open up for an analysis that is less static and more dynamic, opening up for the possibility that there are shifts in positions. Uh, and I mean, I mean, overall, I would say as a general comment, I think we're where peace and conflict research is uh, right now is, has been, in a sort of, to my sense, an overemphasis on, on the sort of the behavior of conflict. Uh, there's been a lot of research on the sort of the, the identity and the sort of actor perspective. But the whole I question about issues are basically a, a, bl a blank box in many ways. I mean, we're left with basically extremely uh, um, uh, rough. Uh, categorizations of issues that are really, really static and uh, uh, do not allow shifts over time. Uh, and uh, here I'm starting to open up the, 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 the analysis of sort of changes from time, looking, looking at sort of how you, what happens with questions, that, uh, conflicts that have had a religious dimension and the, the, the conflict is removed. Uh, and the, the process that I, that I discuss is basically about you should get change in prior priorities, you get change in the formulation of, of the role of religion. Uh, <clears throat> you get uh, situations where uh, religion is moved from the battlefield to the, to the ballot box, so to say. You get sort of uh, not a change in the demands, but in the, the means of achieving them. So you get a sort of a, a re uh, politicization. 
those are processes that are sort of top-down, that are elite-driven. They could also be processes that are more maybe structural or, or driven from below. Uh, the delegitimization, uh, often sort of as a consequence of uh, very uh, atrocities uh, directed uh, towards civilians and so forth. You've got fractionalizations, uh, uh, and you also got um, I forgot actually what this was about. Sorry, but that was a very meaningful um, theoretical concept that I invented. <laughs> but I, I, I forgot what it was about. But it was something very meaningful. I'll, I'll come back on that. Okay, so just to 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 end, um, what are the implications for 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 policy and for 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 uh, for our research on 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 conflict resolution and religion. I, I mean, the, 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 the basic take on this is that do not exaggerate, do not uh, put too much emphasis on religious aspect. It is one among several, but it is there. Uh, and, and I think my research shows that something happens to a conflict once you have appeal to the, to the sacred. Something happens that changes the dyna dynamics of the conflict and makes it more difficult to resolve. Uh, I would also sort of make a, a sort of a, a note about the gender implications because many of these agreements that I have sort of categorized as, as some way of looking at sort of a successful cases, I mean, have quite severe <laughs> negative implications from a, from a gender perspective. So you, you should I mean, be aware that, that uh, my cases of success is, is sort of a bit um, gender biased in that way. And the, the, to, to end, I would like to, to, to quote the, the, the peace research Kenneth Boulder. If it exists, it is possible. I mean, that's the basic rationale for this, to try to find cases uh, where you were actually able to, through the negotiation process, uh, have a, a meaningful dialogue. I mean, that goes back to the Israeli, is he here, the Israeli ambassador? He was sitting over there, he's gone. But his, his question about can you have meaningful dialogue uh, with religious actors? Can you have a sort of a dialogue between the secular and the religious? Uh, uh, and my answer to that is yes. Um, so I actually also want to uh, start by saying thank you. Thank you to Monica and thank you to Isaac for, for coming here. Um, I, I consider us uh, some sort of a little group of people that have like drawn inspiration from each other. We've of course drawn inspiration from many others as well, but this is, um, these are my peers and they are, um, do such great work that I, um, I'm very happy that they could take the time to come to Prio to present their work. Uh, and also thanks to Scott for, for providing comments later on. Um, and Gina for getting the, the funding together. <laughs> um, so what I'll uh, present on here is uh, work that I did for my uh, dissertation. Uh, so for Monica and Isaac, it might be old news, most of this. Uh, but hopefully for some of you, um, you will not have heard this before, so it won't be uh, as boring. But this is going to be a very uh, sort of abstract, very general overview. So if ever there was a, a bird perspective, this is, this is when it's coming. Um, so I'm looking at uh, the religion conflict nexus. And the presentation here is not going to go into much detail in terms of theory and so on, but just give a broad overview of some of the things that I've been working on um, in terms of global trends in the onset of uh, particularly of civil war uh, and also in severity of uh, interstate uh, conflict and, and what religion, um, how religion, religion matters or sometimes doesn't matter as much uh, for those uh, things. So of course a lot has been said about religion and conflict and, and a lot of, there's a lot, a large literature uh, written about the role of religion in war and violence in general. And some of the statements that have been made have been very strong. And these are some um, quotes from various scholars that are famous and have shaped the debate in many respects, um, making quite bold statements about the, the link between 
religion and war. So Mark Jürgensmeyer, for instance, said that the idea of warfare has long had an eerie and intimate relationship with religion. Uh, Martin Marty has said that the collisions of faith or the collisions of peoples of faith are amongst the most threatening conflicts around the world in the new millennium. They grow more ominous and lethal every season. Putting a, a pretty gloomy outlook on, on what we have uh, before us. This was in 2005. Uh, and then um, Sam Huntington, of course, uh, one of the more famous people in looking at the idea of civilizations and how the, the interactions between people of different faiths has um, shaped history. He is, has said that whenever one looks uh, along the perimeter of Islam, Muslims have problems living peacefully with their neighbors. Uh, so these are some of the big statements that have been made about religion in general and some many specific uh, statements made about Islam. Uh, I will look at some um, specific but very broad questions um, in this presentation. So first I want to just say something briefly about what is religious conflict. It echoes some of what was said earlier today in the morning session. Uh, I will then also talk a little bit about when and how I think religion becomes an organizing principle for violent conflict, but not going into too much theoretical detail. This is going to be a, a rather superficial um, overview, unfortunately. Um, and then I'll say something briefly about whether conflicts involving a religious dimension uh, are indeed more severe from the research that I have done. Um, and are some religions particularly violent? Are there certain religious traditions um, that are involved in more severe uh, violence or more often involved in violence than others. So a lot of the work that I've been doing has been in a way to, um, it, this sor sort of echoes what was said in the morning session about the secular versus religious. Very often people talk about religious conflict and what do they actually mean when they say that. Religious conflict is a very big term and it's a, a sort of a catch-all phrase for a lot of different interpretations. So I think that one of the more important things that we can do as if we want to do some serious research on the role of religion is to be much clearer in how we define the concepts that we use. If we want to use a huge concept such as religious terrorism or religious conflict, we need to say what we mean by when we say that, because people mean different things. And I think that there are, to sort of take that concept apart, one of the things that I've, um, been doing is to look at different dimensions. How can we, in a reasonable way, measure the different ideas that people have when they say religious conflict? And one dimension to look at is um, the actors involved in the conflict. Do the actors involved in conflict uh, belong to different religious traditions or the same? Um, uh, are, they, are the actors uh, belonging to some sort of traditional interpretation of religion or do they have some sort of more extreme um, religious identity. So that's the, the, just looking at the actors that are actually involved in, in an armed conflict. And then the other dimension that I was interested in were the issues involved in the conflict. So what um, Isaac was talking about in terms of what are people actually fighting over? And does that have religion as part of the different issues um, in the conflict? Is it a minor or, or, or a major incompatibility in a conflict? Are there particular demands for, for instance, religious freedom or particular um, laws that you want to have um, guiding society and so on? These are the types of issues that um, could have a religious dimension and that could be used if one wants to define what religious conflicts are versus less religious conflicts or no non-religious conflicts. And then the third dimension that I thought uh, might be useful uh, is to look at the rhetoric in conflicts. If there's active use of religious symbols, for instance, to mobilize people and to bring people along and justification for why you do what you do. Uh, so these, uh, in my work, I've been trying to look at the different conflicts uh, over the last 20 years or so, um, particularly civil wars, uh, and to see which conflicts can be con considered religious conflicts uh, on these different dimensions. Because some, some conflicts have one of these, some conflicts have all of these dimensions, and some have none. So we need to map out the terrain a little bit better, I thought, when I did this work. 
So in terms of the actor perspective, um, this, uh, this is basically looking at the time period from 1989 up to uh, 2010, and looking at the civil war. So these are wars where um, an armed challenger is opposing the state. So these are between state and, and, and challenges um, within the country. If the, um, if the two sides have some sort of affiliation with different world religions, or if they have any religious difference between them at all. So the state is primarily belonging to one religion, rebel groups primarily to another religion. Uh, and what we see here, so my, in my dissertation work, I, I ended the graph here in 2004. And so I had this increase here. This is the share of the conflicts that have uh, actors belonging to different uh, religions. Um, and there was an uptick here. So uh, there was a steady sort of increase over time after the point when I stopped my analysis for my dissertation work, which now it's actually on the decrease again. I've updated this data. But anyways, um, the important thing here is like what, what uh, Isaac was saying in his previous presentation. The number of conflicts overall is going down. But these, at least up to this point, the religious conflicts seem to be more sticky. They were constituting a larger and larger share of the diminishing numbers of conflicts in the world. Um, there are still quite a few, so about 30% of conflicts have, um, this is um, using the pre owned Ypsala armed conflict data set, by the way, um, have um, actors belonging to different religions. So it's a, it's a large share of conflicts, but it's not, as Isaac also said, it's not, the, it's not so that every conflict is like this, where the, the parties have different religious affiliation. Now, this is the issues perspective. Um, again, echoing some of the, the graphs that Isaac was showing in his presentation, um, there's, a very, there's quite a small share that I find where uh, religion is a main issue in a conflict. Uh, I find quite a lot more where it's something that has been mentioned as an issue, but it's not the main issue that people are, are, are fighting over. And although there is, um, there was an uptick here. This graph ends in 2004, which is, I have not been able to update this graph yet. I saw an, uh, an uptick here in the share of conflicts that had these issues. Uh, being central or being at least part of what was fought over in the conflicts. Again, keeping in mind that the, uh, the total number of conflicts is actually going down. So it's clear that religion is not maybe the most important thing in most conflicts, but it certainly is there. And over time, it might have become more important um, in terms of becoming an issue in more of the conflicts that we actually see uh, around the world. So this was the uptick that I sort of saw and, and talked about in my introduction to my dissertation when I was sort of like mapping out the terrain. Um, this is a, a problem that might continue into the future, and we, um, we should be aware of these conflicts and how to solve them, like what Isaac was talking about. <clears throat> but then I was interested, of course, in understanding more about uh, when does religion matter for conflict onset? So I was interested in when conflicts start, what is the role that, that religion plays in this? So the, the traditional hypothesis, or one of the things that's been tested the most in the quantitative studies of, of civil wars is this alternative or traditional hypothesis, which is, is the second one on this slide, uh, that religious conflicts emerge when countries are religiously divided. Uh, so you have different religious identity groups in a country, or in the sort of very bold uh, way of stating it, that large minorities excuse me, a cause conflict to occur, which I had a problem with. I couldn't quite get my head around why it's just because there are different groups out there that there should necessarily be wars, um, and also because these are quite static in most of the analysis that we've done. We should do more of figuring out how group size changes over time, which is something Monica has worked a lot on. Um, but basically, I was not happy with just saying there's diversity out there, hence there should be conflict. So what I try to do is to look at the context in which religion becomes important. So people need to um, go out there and um, 
commit to a cause, commit to going out and committing violence, this is high risk behavior. Um, there must be something in the context that makes this more salient. And one of the things that I looked at then in particular was religious repression, or how I used to define it then was um, infringements on religious freedom. Um, and if this could somehow trigger a process by which um, conflicts emerge. So I did a global analysis of this from 1990 to 2004, looking at the onset of civil wars uh, in terms of different definitions, both based on the actors involved and the issues um, at stake. Looking at whether re religious repression mattered for wh where we see um, these religious civil wars starting. And looking also at the alternative explanation that is, it's about group size. Um, and then adding a whole bunch of um, traditional control variables. Um, so this is how I measured then religious repression or religious freedom violations. I had two um, sort of different measures. One was uh, from zero to three, where zero is that basically complete religious freedom in the country, to three where there's absolutely no religious freedom, and two sort of in between categories based on um, US State Department uh, religious freedom reports. I also looked at different forms of repression of religious minorities. This is a list of sort of important ones that you can, that these reports from the US State Department say something about reasonably consistently across if they, if they see some of these things happening. Uh, so I was make, then making a scale out of how many of these do you see in different countries in different years. So this is arrest, detention and harassment of minorities, forced conversions, uh, restrictions on uh, proselytizing and so on, different, different ways in which states go after religious minorities in that country. Um, so what do I find then? This is onset of religious conflict in terms of this issue dimension. So in these conflicts, the religion is part of what they're fighting over. It can be a main issue or it can be a sort of a secondary issue, but somehow religious conflict onset in this definition. I find that country years where there's higher restrictions of religious freedom have more likely to have uh, the onset of these types of conflicts. So when states go after religious minorities and restrict religious freedom, they are more likely than other states to have a backlash in terms of having religious uh, conflicts uh, emerge. However, when I take apart, oops, wrong. Um, so this is the sort of first finding here, a positive impact, higher religious, um, repression, more likelihood of having onset of religious conflict. I take this apart, so this is the zero to three category, uh, um, and zero is the reference category here, and we see that for this highest level where there's absolutely no religious freedom, so the state is really clamping down, then we don't actually see a, a sort of a positive effect in terms of having more risk of conflict. So of course there are extreme cases where nothing, no opposition has a viable chance at all, uh, but there still is some effect of clamping down has a backlash effect. Um, I mean, I think that echoes also what Monica said. If the go state goes in, tries to clamp down, uh, it can come back to haunt them. Maybe this is particular for religious conflicts. Maybe this is a stronger effect for religious conflicts than for other conflicts. Um, and that's something that I don't really know, but I, um, I think it's something to think about. Um, Again, I find uh, using the repression scale of the different forms of religious uh, freedom um, violations that states do, I find the same effect that the more of these uh, restrictions and harassment uh, behaviors that states engage in, the more likely they are to see onset of religious conflicts. I think I have prepared way too many slides, so I'll try to either skip or go very fast. Um, so this, this is basically the argument, the alternative argument. This is a size issue. It's about how big is the largest minority. And if the minority is big, then you will see conflict. I don't find anything significant here for any dif like different definition of what is a religious conflict onset. So um, that was that. So are religious conflicts more severe? Uh, there are many reasons that have been stated for why we could expect that. Uh, are religious identities uh, particularly important to people? Are the problems like issue indivisibility problems, or are these things related to religion more, more difficult to negotiate, which is something uh, uh, Isaac talked about? 
this talk about eternity and how people fight in a different way, maybe when there's religion involved. So uh, the literature basically plays up this argument that uh, religion should somehow lead to more bloody conflicts. And then this, also this reasonably large literature on whether Islam somehow is particularly pro problematic. Um, so I also so I look at both as religious versus non-religious uh, conflicts, and also if there are particular religions that are associated with higher levels of the bloody, more bloody conflicts. So uh, the way that I measure severity in, in my work here, this note, the only ways that this could be done, there are many other measures that could be sort of tested and run uh, here. But one is the battle-related deaths in civil wars. So how many people die on the battlefield in these conflicts versus in these religious conflicts versus other conflicts? and also the degree of state repression. So are, um, are states that are, belong to particular religions more repressive than others? Or are those that are more religious in their, sort of, in their law and their constitution and more repressive? Um, and I don't actually find, um, so this is the first series for these battle deaths in the civil wars. Conflicts where actors belong to different religions are not more severe than other conflicts, from my findings. And religious states, or the, the states that I've defined as religious, uh, or religious rebels, are also not involved in more severe conflicts. So this, are, of course, is looking at one form of conflict and one way of measuring severity. But with this combination, I actually don't find that these um, religious conflicts are any worse. Um, I do actually find, I, and then I look into the issues at stake here, and whether religion is a ma major issue or a minor issue in conflicts, and what types of aims the rebel groups have in the conflicts. And for most of these measures, I don't really find much of an effect either. The only exception is that um, when uh, rebel groups are aiming um, at a, establishing a different religion in a contested territory, then you can see uh, an significantly higher um, number of battle deaths for the period after uh, 1989. So for the most, the most recent conflicts, um, and with this aim, there's a higher uh, battle deaths. But um, yeah. I look at uh, Muslim governments and Muslim rebels, and actually find that um, there, there are no significant, statistically significant effects here looking at all the civil wars. The number of battle-related deaths in these conflicts involving one or both sides uh, being Muslim is actually not um, having an impact. Um, and I also even tried to look at if whether one or the other side can be said to have fundamentalist goals or if one of the aims of the rebels is establishing an Islamic state. And I also don't find that these conflicts are more severe in terms of battle-related deaths in civil wars. And then I look at uh, this repression scale where I'm interested to see, is it so that Muslim states or um, states dominated by Muslim, uh, Muslim population are more repressive than other states? Because this has been said very often, or it's a common assumption. I'm not claiming that this should necessarily be so. I'm just sort of going out there, looking at the world. Does it hold? Uh, so again, this is a um, statistical test from 1980 to 2000. And the higher level, the higher score on this dependent variable, what we're interested in explaining, the more repressive is the government. Uh, and here, I actually don't find, this is co-authored work with Indra de Soisa, uh, published in ISQ in 2007. Muslim states did not perform worse than other states uh, on state repression in this period when we control for other important factors that are typically used to explain um, state repression. Um, it could be a function of this time period, we don't know, but still there's no inherent higher uh, repression in, in these Muslim dominated uh, states. So this is the, just the share of Muslims in the country and this is a different measure of a Muslim state being an OIC, OIC member. Um, so uh, why do I find what I find? Uh, 
there can be many explanations for the, the findings here. It could be that just religion is, doesn't have the effect that we think it would have. Uh, for instance, that conflicts in involving religion generally are not more severe because what we assume about religion's effect is not what we think it is. Um, but I think there could be many other explanations as well that go better together with the sort of the, the case studies that we know of where religion has had an impact uh, on conflict. And it could have to do with measurement issues and all those sort of nitty gritty details of how we conduct analysis. Um, one thing that I was thinking is that maybe uh, religious groups are, have a tendency to become, to be smaller. The more religious a group, maybe they are smaller groups that have less capacity to actually carry out a lot of uh, these battle-related deaths. Uh, maybe they can carry out other types of violence instead. Or maybe they target their use of violence for certain other types of violence than what is actually captured in this measure of battle-related casualties. That's, that's one thing to, to talk about or to discuss and maybe test further. Um, and it could, it could also well be that with the sort of the global development of how we look at religion, essentially non-religious conflicts might be recast as religious conflicts. They then might not have this sort of religious fury that we think is driving up severity of conflict because, they're recently, because the, the religious dimension is just a, sort of a thin veneer and it's not really motivating people to go out and, and kill more uh, of their enemies. These are also other things that, that could potentially explain the findings of why the way religious conflict is defined here and, and battle-related deaths is not as closely re related as some, as some uh, parts of the literature would suggest. Um, I also find, like I said, that conflicts involving Islam, actors and or issues, uh, are also not more severe than other conflicts in these types of conflicts that I'm looking at here. It could well be that a lot of the stuff that's going on that's reported in the media is not necessarily was captured in this analysis here of civil wars. It could also be that media tends to focus more on certain types of conflicts and forget to report about all these other conflicts that are going on, like say the DRC or other, other major conflicts that are going on get very little attention. So we sort of forget about the broader picture. Uh, so we have to remember here that uh, this is comparing all the conflicts that are going on. If, if we were to look at a, the development of one conflict over time and see uh, at one point the conflict becomes more religious and just after that the violence has an uptick, that would be maybe more what people um, are basing this notion on that religion um, affects uh, conflict. Um, so that's also something to think about. Uh, the last point I also wanted to make here is like an explanation for some of the counterintuitive finding is that it is possible that religion sustains conflicts that would have otherwise died out. That there's something about religion that makes people go on and continue to fight despite the odds. So they're small fringe groups, the state has been trying everything to crush them, they might lie dormant for a while, they reappear, or they continue to go on even when it's not rational in the sense of winning. They know that they won't win, they still continue. So in that sense, if that is what's happening here, then that could mean that there's an over-representation of these small conflicts that just linger on forever, uh, and that that somehow um, uh, biases the sample or uh, makes conflicts more sticky when religion is uh, part of what's fought over. Uh, I've gone over time, but these are my conclusions. Um, so religious conflict as a concept is multifaceted and there are different conceptualizations out there and I challenge all researchers and others to be much more careful in thinking about exactly what are we talking about to define their concepts better um, and so that we can account for this multifaceted um, uh, religious conflict uh, concept. Uh, I also find in my research that it's not religious diversity in itself uh, that drives conflict. There's something more about how religion plays out. We need to take into account the conceptual factors, not only in when we're doing the case analysis of particular conflicts, but also for statistical analysis. We need to look at the context in which religion become, becomes important. Uh, I find that, uh, or I, th I think that my, my data says something that 
religion can become an organizing principle for people um, when their identity group is threatened, when there, there is some sort of oppression or repression of, of religious groups. And so we need to look at those political sort of contexts in which religion starts to really matter for people. I don't find that any one religion appears to be more necessarily more violent than others. Um, I find effect on religion in certain ways when I, in certain way, in certain parts of the analysis, but it's not consistent across all measures. Um, but in some sense, uh, the religious effect might be substantially smaller than, say, the effect of various other political indicators or economic factors and so on. So we always need to keep that broader perspective in mind. Uh, we, if we know that religion matters, that's important, but how important is it relative to the all these other things that we know uh, uh, matters and that we should care about. Still, religion is clearly a, a major driver of conflicts today um, and still an important research topic that um, should have more, more rigorous and more um, analysis and more, more detailed um, understandings of the um, dynamics at play. So that's where I'll end. Thank you very much. I can hear a feedback, so to speak. OK, I, am, uh, I have specific comments, but I was told I have about 10 minutes. And in 10 minutes, I couldn't. I think if I went point by point on each of these, that would be problematic and not as interesting. So what I'm going to try to do is provide a more general perspective, a general overview of these papers plus um, this morning's address and kind of look at the variations and uh, all, look at it from stepping back a little bit. Um, and so I'll start by stepping back a long ways. And I guess I will just, if I came into the, if I came from outer space and I had no context by which to understand what religion is, I would have no idea what it is after sitting through all of these lectures today. I would have no clue. I would not know what you were talking about. Nobody's really, there's, these, there's some kind of things glimmering there. Uh, the question and answer, the, you guys in religious history, you kind of brought some stuff in there, but none of the speakers talked about what is religion, really. Um, if you really know the data sets and things like that, then Rognell's discussion and things like that. But, what do we mean by religion? And there is something to be said for what the first, in trying to create dichotomies about what religion is or not, then in many ways, very, very die-hard doctrinaire Marxist <laughs> exhibits many elements that seem like religion. And I think that was a very appropriately stated construct at the beginning. And I think that we need to think about that when we talk about religion and conflict. Really, what is it that we're talking about in what is religion? And if we take that concept, that's stepping way out here, and we step in towards it, what is religious conflict? And I'm not, I, I have really big problems, not just with my question in the morning, with terrorism. I'm much happier with violence and talking about violence um, or conflict to step back that doesn't have to be violent either. And I think that's where the discussion this morning and the discussion this afternoon, even though in some ways they seem like they're very much at odds, they actually are really very similar. Because even though they're taking up these issues, the, ways, the way that they're approached is actually quite similar in, look, especially the way Isak does it, in looking down at, OK, here, or kind of the bases of conflict. We're not worrying about whether it's violent or not. We're just seeing, is there a potentiality for some sort of conflict to emerge between this group in society and that group in society? Um, but beyond that, what role does religion play? We had some discussion um, today, I mean, er, in the morning, the discussion, the, the, the presentation and the discussion were on the, the problems with dichotomous bi binary defi definitions. 
We have some elements of that this afternoon, but most of the time there's more variation and you see that there's competing goals, there's competing senses of identity, that you can have many things going on at once, which I think is in the spirit of the critique this morning. And that is that these are complex organizations and we have to treat them as complex organizations. So that religion may be one of many things that are playing a role in the conflict. But how do I identify whether it, what's the degree by which it's playing a role? Um, Isak talked about peripheral and central. Ragnild talked about um, major and minor. But it seems to be there's more that we could explore as well. Um, one thing to think about, and I don't know to what degree it's, I haven't seen it done systematically, but where does a group lie in the context, the cultural context by which it's located, the conflict or the, the group is located? And that is, there is some sort of theological variation, how one interprets the beliefs and the text or non-text or practices. And throughout history, this has been a very big, big deal between ones who we label as extreme or fundamental or radical, as opposed to centrists or mainstream. You might have religion as an extremely important issue, but you, on a theological dimension, may be quite moderate. But you could also not consider it really the thing that's going to tend you toward violence, but you might be way, way out there in terms of uh, belief structure um, relative to the, to the norms. Take an example like the Society of Friends or what Quakers. That's, there's a fairly radical ideology in that period and that notion of Protestantism, theologically, but then the nonviolent principles make it so that it's not violent. So, I mean, there's these types of variations and variegations between groups that I think we need to be thinking about in terms and being culturally specific. Beyond that, even in a theological, now this is my economist coming out, you can kind of imagine a space, and we could map a theological space, and you could have variation and measure degrees and how many utils you get for being in that faith or whatever. But you could also do this in a policy space, and that's more common. And you might have very, very similar beliefs, but you have a very, very different attitude about certain social issues. Okay? Take the issue of abortion in the US. Similar theological groups may have a very similar position theologically about the question, but what type of actions and its moral aspects then come out in a different way in terms of the policy and how one votes or how one takes other forms of action in the political arena. All of those things, I think, are important if we're going to think about what role does religion play in conflict, and then what role does religion play in violence attitudes towards violence within the group, and then also these policy and other spaces that we need to think about. So I think these are areas where we can need to think about theoretically and make distinctions. And I do think what's really, really important here is where does a group sit in juxtaposition to other groups in a country, and more importantly, the elite that represent government or elite in the society in general. Okay. So if we're going to talk about the role of religion, role of religion is going to be important to the group. And I think this came out in all of the talks here, talking about recruitment, mobilization. But more importantly, and Ragnil brought this up, and that is it's also retention of people in the group. You can get them to join. But if these are, as Isak's talking about, long struggles, then you need to keep people in the group, and they can't just drift away and go away. Um, you need to keep them in the group, and you want them to be internally motivated to stay in the group, not externally motivated to stay in the group. Now, in addition to the role of religion for the group to preserve the central members of the group, any group engaged in some form of conflict, especially violent conflict with the state, 
has to worry about a complicit public. They're going to need support from some group in society. That's to protect them so that they can go in, but also they're, they're all going to appeal because this provides legitimacy and things like this. Where does that group come into the picture? What role does identity come in, and where does the group that is supposedly the public that the group is representing through their activities, who are they representing, and who are they representing, and where does that group sit in society, too? I think we need to think about those. And this is where I think Monica's, your, your setup kind of establishes some of those contextual pictures. And then what it does really nicely is it moves into where does that group sit vis-a-vis -vis elites in society? Some sort of, are there patterns of exclusion? Are there patterns of what um, we can talk about as horizontal inequality, inequalities between groups? Um, exclusion is probably a better terminology in terms of religion and the social aspects of it. But I think that that leads into what Monica is talking about, and that is the, group, the dynamics, the dynamics between the state and the group, the action, reaction. The group forms. What actions does it take? How does the state respond? And Monica came through quite nicely in talking about the different kinds of responses. And what's really interesting in her analysis is you see that there's a different type of response by different kinds of groups. What would be interesting to explore, going back and taking a step back, and then looking at some of the other particulars relating to the groups. In a, in a case study, you've got more of those things controlled, but it would be really nice if you could like highlight those differences across cases, um, if there are those kinds of variations. Maybe there aren't, but um, of standing up here and having just thought of that thought, I am not quick enough to think of it, how much variation on some sort of table and draw it on the board. Um, I also think that there's aspects which are really, really interesting, and I think they go back to attitudes towards particular policies, attitudes towards identity, identity vis-a-vis -vis the elites in a national society, where those people lie, or how they're distributed in society. This is something that Monica talked about too, but it's really important. If the group with a separate religious identity lies in a distinct part of the country, that's going to, have a, that's going to affect tactics, it's going to affect goals, it's going to affect what the group wants to do differently than if they're all spread out and it's a minority that's evenly spread out throughout that society. Those things are going to matter. The geographic aspects of the group itself are going to matter to how these things happen. There's elements of this, but I don't see these things coming together in way, or at least maybe I'm proposing things that future ideas for people in the audience or the people here in the table. And maybe they've done it and I'm just going on. Um, then finally, uh, this is the question that all, all three, plus today, we kind of talked, much less this morning, but all three presentations this afternoon came. And that is this, I think it's an interesting puzzle. And I'm just going to state it as a puzzle with four non-competing hypotheses. <laughs> There's no binariness in my uh, presentation. But that. There's a statement, I think Isak said it, and he said, religion comes late in the game. So we see a pattern, and it really came out in the story that Monica said. She didn't phrase it that way, but it came in through the pictures of the, the different leaders. That, and why is it that religion comes in late in the game? Well, here's some four non-competing hypotheses that I'll just throw up in the air. One is that religious-based, the role of religion is just uh, an aspect of our time. It's kind of a zeitgeist. Um, you know, the spirits of our times are uh, what dictates that religion's the thing. It's so 60s to be nationalist. Now religion's the thing to be. So that there's some sort of uh, notion like that. And, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to kind of making fun of it by saying like that, but I actually think there may be a lot that one could say. 
Related to this notion of a zeitgeist is a, um, a contagion. Uh, and that is that you see certain groups are really successful doing this. They're in your neighborhood, and you say, or in the region, and now that the neighborhood is expanding because of global media, and you say, whoa, well, that was pretty effective. Um, Diego Gambetta does a, uh, he's a colleague of Monica's in Oxford who does a informal, he doesn't publish this, but it's quite an inform, nice informal tracing of suicide terrorism and how it, how it traces its roots, starts in an aspect with Black September and then moves to Sri Lanka, perfected there, and then moves out again back to the Middle East again. And he details all the types of innovations that occur and how responses by the state occur and then there's a new response and it's a very interesting aspect. But what's underlying that is that there's a notion of people copying one another. In, these, in a struggle to survive, where your life is at line, you look out there and you see successful strategies. Well, I'll try that. Um, in addition to those two, I think this is what underscores Monica's work. And I think that there has to be some aspect to this. And that is that group state dynamics create a pattern by which religion was going to come in. That is not intern That doesn't necessarily compete with the other ones especially if they're more successful and the government's getting rid of certain groups who are nationalist, then they're going to, you're going to, well, who's going to be left? Well, it's going to be the more surviving, the, the strategy that's more effective in, in keeping uh, a movement and a violent rebellion going. And then finally, there, and this is one thing we didn't talk about, and it goes back to what I opened with, and that is not opening with what is religion, but opening with the notion of what is extreme. And that is um, maybe there's intra-group competition. You have several groups. You have different groups or members. And they're competing for who's going to be the representative of our group. Well, there is an aspect for by, by going towards more extreme positions, you marcate yourself and demarcate yourself from other groups that are in opposition to the state. And I, I don't see any of these as competing hypotheses. In fact, I think, see them spreading together and working together. And I, if anybody wants to add another one, I'll, it's just my own little private thought that came up when, um, when Isak said that. But I'll end with that, and I'm, I'm definitely sure I went over time. Sorry. Oh, it's OK. <laughs> no, it was, uh, I think it was a perfect way to end it with those four hypotheses. That is um, a food for, for, for all of us, I can imagine. Look, uh, I've already started making a list, actually, of people. And uh, um, I. Uh, it's, it's quite a rare occasion that we have so many different disciplines gathered in a small room to discuss these uh, topics. Uh, and I want to, to make sure that we have uh, um, that, uh, that uh, different disciplines also gets, gets to talk. But uh, I've asked uh, Professor Gunning to just give a few thoughts uh, uh, linking his talk up to this talk. So, uh, and for those of you who were here in the morning, you're probably as well curious kind of how, how, you, see, how, how you see this. And then uh, I'll continue uh, with a list and just, yeah, uh, give me a sign as, as, as people are talking and I will put you down. Thank you. Yes. I think you should use the microphone. Um, thank you very much. I thought that these were very interesting papers. Just to kind of link it back to this morning, because um, what's interesting that between the th your three papers, there was also a disagreement. For example, y your, your paper uh, um, was suggesting that religion doesn't make conflicts m more severe on the whole, whereas um, Monica's paper suggested that in the case of, of, of Chechnya, it did in terms of lethality, etc. And in some ways, I think, linking it back to my argument, mm -hmm. that that is a perfect illustration of what I was trying to wrestle with, that if you look at religion as an aggregate, 
it is far too blunt an instrument to make any um, any definitive statements about this being different. And as, as you as you showed, um, there isn't anything particularly different about religion versus non-religious conflict. If you look at particular conflicts, and particularly at the goal structure, for example, your Islamists in Chechnya, um, if you look at, at the way they define their goals, they think about their conflict, as you very um, very nicely kind of um, showed, that affects their targets, it, they, they offer soft targets, therefore they're more lethal because they're not being protected as much, etc. So you can see how beliefs feed into the types of tactics, but it's because of the particular structure of the beliefs, not because they're Islamist or Islamic, but because of their particular Islamism, if you like. Um, and if you compare it, for example, to Hamas or Hezbollah, you have very different tactics because their particular Islamisms are different again. So this, for me, seems to reinforce the sense that it is important to look at beliefs, but not to um, 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 generalize ac across religion, because that's just, it's, it's too big um, a form. And one thing that uh, would be interesting to kind of to look at in the case of, of Monica is, to what extent are, are these belief-driven behaviors? To what extent, because you alluded that it was partly because of a sort of elite divisions that, you know, some were, were, were killed and then others were, were, were trying to kind of mobilize on different grounds. Um, but you know, to, to what extent is it is it the context of these other of these Islamist groups that makes them more lethal? Um, do they get funding or more funding from from say Saudi Arabia? For, for example, there's, there's there's groups in Syria that are now Islamist because that's where the funding comes from. That means they have more 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 capability, so they could be more more lethal because they have more capability. You know, other elements like that. It's not the beliefs themselves only, but also the context within which they operate. And particularly interesting there is to what extent are they embedded? Uh, because I find in, in, in the Middle East that when a group is embedded in society, it is much more restrained because it knows that there are costs to being too lethal. When a group is more isolated and more vanguardist and sort of, you know, mm -hmm. all of society is corrupt, uh, we are the only re re remaining vanguard, they tend to be more lethal because the, the costs to them look, look less. Um, then I had two, two more points um, on one thing on what Isaac was saying about religious conflicts being more intractable, that it was more difficult to get to peace agreements in, in, in your findings. Um, and I wonder, in some ways, I mean, you, you were also talking about sort of how, how, how conflicts morphed into religious conflict, but actually it's not about religion as such, although there may be something about religion as well, but that these are the conflicts that have morphed and therefore are the more intractable, and therefore it's the in intractability of the conflict rather than the, the, the religion that makes them intractable, if you see what I mean. Because they, they are long-standing conflicts, they're already they're, they're ongoing, and they now use a relig religious imagery in a way that they didn't before. But those are, are probably the conflicts that, that are the most difficult to resolve because they've been going on for, for quite long. Um, there may also be another el element in, in terms of um, how, how people respond to, to conflicts. I mean, there was a period when if you were a separatist, then that was taken seriously. I mean, as, as Monica suggested, for international relations people, that's important because that affects the state. Whereas religious claims weren't taken seriously for quite a long time, e even by policymakers. So that might mean that you then, if you, um, that 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 has a there's a different response rate to whether it's a secular or religious group at first, and now of course it has s switched around, and then you get sort of the issue of success in copying others, um, where people then might use religion because they see it, it works elsewhere. And then. Yeah, just one more thing on, on the timing. What's really interesting about this, if you look, if you go back a hundred years, if you, for example, the, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, the first Palestinian resistance against uh, the, the Jewish Im immigration in the 1920s was very religious, um, and I think that was because in that kind of context and zeitgeist, I mean, there wasn't anything like Palestinian nationalism as such. It was Syrian nationalism, but what what, what really kind of um, Brought people together was sort of the, the the idea that this was an attack on the on the holy places of Islam and uh, religious festivals were used as, as sites of, of of contest and resistance. So that then turned in, into a secular conflict later on in some for the Palestinians. Um, you could argue. Anyway, fi the final thing is on the secularization. I thought that was a really interesting point about you need to desacralize conflicts. But again, I would go beyond religion because um, when you talk about nationalism, the Battle of Kosovo, for example that had turned to, to into a sacred trope, which had made it very difficult to, to negotiate about anything because that had become sacralized. And I think it's the, and this goes back to my point about Monica's kind of case being different. It's it's the kind of beliefs that are being used that make it important rather than whether it's religious. So if whether people say this is sacred, therefore you can't negotiate, 
um, whether they say God is the ultimate arbiter, which I think has a nationalist and a Marxist e equivalent, where you, without God, you can talk about the ultimate arbiter of Marx or Lenin, um, and we can't go beyond this because this is the ultimate al arbiter. It's the kind of belief logic that is being used that makes conflict in, 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 intransigent. And it would be really interesting to look at other conflicts that are not religious that use these same types of dynamics. These were just some. We're uh, a few direct challenges, but I think we'll have just uh, uh, gather up a few questions now, and then uh, you will be able to answer. Can you present yourself? Okay. Yeah. I'm uh, Henrik Urdal. I'm a senior researcher at uh, the Center for the Study of Civil War at PRIO. Uh, first, I just have to correct a, a factual error, and that's that Monica's article, excellent article with Yuri Shuko, is coming out not in JCR, but in the excellent Journal of Peace Sorry, Research. JPR. And <laughs> it's coming out in two <laughs> weeks' time. <laughs> and I happen to be the editor of JPR as well, so I, I should know. Um, Thank you for accepting it. It's, it's you have so many articles, I understand. It's, I it's very hard to keep track of Actually, all JCR of them. Actually, JCR won't take me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, m my comment and, and question regard, uh, regards the, uh, the so what I consider one of the take-home messages from both Isaac and Monica, uh, that religion is something that enters at a later stage in many of these conflicts. So uh, conflicts may start for one reason, but then they are sort of reinvented as, as religious conflicts at a later stage. At least that's one possible scenario. So my question is really, and th th I guess this is particular to, to Isaac, do we know anything about uh, sort of the w to what extent the relative or absolute increase uh, in religious conflict is driven by recategorization, if you like, uh, or reinvention of conflicts. Uh, so, so conflicts that would move, you know, from your top category to your bottom category, or to what extent they're driven by sort of uh, purely or, or actually new conflicts. Um, uh, so, how many Chechnyas or, or Moros are there uh, in that in that total graph? F and furthermore, I, I I had exactly the same the same reaction. So. To what extent um, is um, if to what extent is selection driving you know uh, the the issue of of uh, of uh, um, uh, to, to what extent is that explaining why it's so difficult to to uh, to solve religious conflicts because uh, if 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 there is you know a significant number of conflicts that are reinvented as religious conflicts it's very possible that these are the conflicts that are so hard to solve in the first place they've been able to survive for such a long time and then they're reinvented as religious conflicts and and it's 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 an entrenched conflict and it's just a, a very difficult conflict to solve whether or not religion enters the picture and that leads me to the final question whether really has anyone looked at what explains why conflicts are uh, dying out versus actually being reinvented as religious conflicts what are the drivers of that transition uh, from from a uh, sort of a non-religious conflict to a religious conflict and what so my particular interest in, in is in demographics so you know could this be in in, in also in, in uh, demographic dynamics between groups could it have Anything to do with a structure, or you know, could it be explanations relating to, you know, the suppression of, of religious uh, uh, activity, uh, sort of things that that uh, are going into this study? Thank you. Thank you. The woman in front, and then we'll pass the words to you. Yes, yes, that's you. <laughs> My name is uh, Farida Ahmedi. I'm writer and um, social anthropologist, and uh, I was born in Afghanistan. Now I'm writing another book in, about Afghanistan. I will. Uh, I wondering. I'm wondering to listen your analyze about Afghanistan. Why this uh, fundamentalist group uh, dev develop so rapidly, and uh, where they come from? It is really local problem. Uh, as Monica said, I agree with your analyzer that religion come, uh, dimension of religion come uh, so late, late. And uh, how to understand the, the Afghanistan problem from the, the various fundamentalist group to Taliban? It is something uh, related uh, each other, it is the nature of Af Afghan people. Why this fundamentalist uh, uh, talk uh, differently? It is uh, talk against the uh, American, and uh, American 
help a lot of military stuff and um, uh, money to the fundamentalists who talk against uh, every day in the um, article of fundamentalist right uh, against the uh, USA. But the Afghan democratic uh, um, different um, uh, party and civil society, no. I know very well in my own experience, but I like to understand uh, what you mean for for understand and write better book about Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we will maybe we just start with Isa. Yeah, we have sure. had a few direct challenges, and then we'll proceed. Should I speak in it? Yeah, all right. So thank you, for, first, Scott, for very insightful comments. And in particular, I, 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 I think your idea about the four uh, propositions about what is... is ex yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that was an extremely interesting um, take on it that will hopefully uh, lead to more interesting research. Uh, just to, to come back to, to Professor... Gunning there. I mean, religion as an aggregate is that too broad to be meaningful? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think it is. It is a useful um, um, uh, conceptualization. Uh, it doesn't explain everything, but it does have implications for conflict resolution, uh, especially if you measure it not in terms of groups, but in terms of diets that I do. I, implying that you could have a religious belief also on the government side, or religious aspirations on the government side, rather than on, on, on the rebel side. Uh, the, the LTT in, in Sri Lanka, where you had the, 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 the uh, Singhala Buddhist uh, uh, groups being one of the main spoilers or sort of obstacles to a negotiated settlement, but which uh, Dr. Friedrich has shown in, in, in her work. Uh, so. Um, uh, I do believe it. Uh, it is. Uh, I mean, it is a theoretical construct, of course. It's. It's something that uh, is it useful. Yes, it depends on whether we we do find anything that is uh, is helpful. But I would challenge also this this notion about beliefs. I mean, organizations don't have beliefs. Uh, it's people, individuals that have belief, beliefs. What organizations have is aspirations, political manifestations of uh, individual beliefs that are sort of on an aggregate level, and that should be our should be our focus, and that I think is is what comes out in in, in my research is that that if you have that kind of sort of uh, uh, aspiration, as explicit aspiration, uh, that are anchored in a religious uh, religi religiously anchored, it makes conflict more difficult to resolve. Uh, and then also to take up the the question about uh, the, the whether this is a just intractable conflict, that goes back to to to, to Henry's question about the selection, is this just entrenched conflicts, basically? Yes, some of them are. I mean, some of these are uh, I mean, uh, uh, very entrenched conflicts, long drawn out, but some are rather short. So I don't think it's, uh, I mean, I do control for, for the duration of conflict in the, in the model. And, and it, so, so I, I, it, it is, uh, I don't think it's so easy to say that these are just a sort of a, the, the, uh, another other way of categorizing intractable conflict. And I do have other controls for that territory and ethnicity and other indicators that could that previous research identifies sort of the way of, of sort of measuring in intractability. The morphing into other groups I think is an uh, important point. But again that could also happen the other way around. So fractionalization is also a way for desacralization. So religious uh, Sort of um, uh, that could be a way of sort of desacralizing uh, sacralizing conflicts, uh, and uh, and just um, to take up uh, Henrik's comment about this, um, to what extent are these dying out and being reinvented? I have a paper that I'm working on for the coming ISA that is going to look at the whether the um, the frequency that we see the change in proportion is is a result of sort of conflicts that are are more religious conflicts are getting started or whether they are sort of uh, have a long longer duration basically 
It's uh, being accepted to an extremely interesting panel on the Vatican's foreign policy. So if you <laughs> please come and visit that panel. Uh, so thanks, Scott, for those comments. Uh, just I'll make three points um, trying to respond to everybody sort of in tandem. Zeitgeist, I agree. Uh, but what I would say is that zeitgeist is always there. And I wouldn't say that it's that religions was pushed uh, that religion pushed itself forward. Religion was sort of an answer to a call because of hyper secularization that happened after decolonization and the failure of many of these secularizing regimes. You can talk about Turkey. Uh, we can, you know, we, we we can just go, you know, Iraq. We can just go through the world. Right. Yeah, the Baathists, I mean, socialism, kind, whatever you want to talk about. And so in a sense, I mean, one of the things that we do in God's century is we say, you know, scholars would have us believe that religion, I mean, people predicted God is dead. Time magazine had a that cover. Sometimes I put it up there from 1966, I think it is. And, and what we really impress upon in this book is to say, no, no, religion is ever present. This, these are thousands of year old sets of beliefs. They change over time. There's no denying it. But they are there, and the idea that um, it can be ignored, they're going to percolate up at different times and different epochs. And so we actually trace it over cut <laughs> millennia in this book um, about how religion waxes and wanes over time, but it never died out. And we just happen to be in a period where the zeitgeist is religious beliefs, religious values, and that sort of thing, in part because states um, have felt as if they needed to contain, control, or just expiate religion from the public arena, and people were unwilling to, and are, and are unwilling to accept that. So it's back to sort of your comment. I think one of the critical, the second point is the a, a critical point, is the dynamic. It's not that these religious actors appear ex nihilo, right? They're reacting to something. Roggen Hill's terrific research about repression, right? So in some cases, yes, these are violent extremists. We can talk about abortionists in the United States. You know, look, we live in a liberal democracy. You've got to accept what the law is, uh, but some choose not to, right? In that case, you know, that that is sort of religious extremist, perhaps, you know, going and doing the bombing and killing, in some cases, doctors. Um, but in other cases, they really are reacting to the state coming in, repressing, and so it's that dynamic. And, you know, one of the, it's not one of my favorite hobbies, but one of the things that really pisses me off about Moscow is we've been here before. They did this in the 19th century. It took them 60 years to defeat the Caucasus tribes. 60 years, right? And, and, and we're seeing the same sort of dynamics happening again. What happened the first time? They took out all the old guard of imams. The moderates, the ones that were willing to work with the state, but Moscow, you know, there's a lot of chauvinism, a lot of ra uh, racism, a lot of imperialism going on in the 19th century. So they killed everybody. And what do you have next? The 20 year old sparks who are going to go down with their kinjal and kill anybody who comes in their way. Well, what's happened this time around? They've killed all the moderates. Assassination, they've been quite successful actually in decapitating these organizations. And what they've left is sort of the extremists. Uh, and that's what we're dealing with now. And so, in a sense, I, I would like to wag my finger and say, Stop it. We've done this before. You're repeating history. And now we've got these extremists. Because it turns out, and in this book, you know, we have data to show this, that most religious actors want to work within the political system. Right? They believe in human rights. They believe in dignity. They believe that governments should provide protection to populations, take care of poverty. They're the poverty providers of the world. You know, the estimates are 30 to 70 percent of religious actors are the ones that, that, that aid goes through religious hands. Norway. Religious Christian um, uh, organizations through Norway deliver a lot of aid in this world. And so what ends up happening is, is that the, a killing off or sort of a repression of these organizations lead to a radicalization. And, the, and again, sort of Ragenhild made this comment earlier that we hear about the bad guys, but we don't hear about the do-gooders. And more often than not, religious actors are actually the do-gooders, but because of the heavy-handedness of sort of these counterinsurgent, counter-extremist, counter-fundamentalist policies that states adopt, they end up radicalizing groups that otherwise, or individuals that otherwise would not be radicalized. Um, and then the last thing, I really want to underscore Isak's point about uh, religious and religious actors. So the data we sh I showed you about Islamist violence, this is where we really feel is very comfortable about saying that it's Islamist, is rare. Civil wars, I track them, and you know, there's 100, I tracked 144 civil wars from 1940 to, to 2010. Only a third of them had a religious tint. 
And of that third, only half was religion, the central core concern. So Tajikistan, you had former communists who wanted to secularize the state, and you had Islamists saying, no, the hell with that, we want Sharia law to really sort of determine our civil code, if not even higher codes. Um, and so in a sense, religion is actually, I have to say, as somebody who studies this stuff, it's actually, I don't want to say it's rare, but it's not the majority of the fights. It's not the most common type of fight. It is when it comes to terrorism today. And Isak is exactly, absolutely right. Half of all civil wars raging today have a religious tint to them, but they're still not as common as I think the media would sort of hype it up. Uh, and then one last thing, I totally agree with you about the localized, the local dimensions, um, and that if you're embedded in the community, and one of the reasons why the wars in the Caucasus are sort of emanating out is precisely, and it has to do with Islam, so I'm going to push back a little bit about the role of Islam and tenets of different kinds of religions. Chechens are Sufi, they believe in localized brotherhoods, right? They, they don't like outsiders coming in, that's why they always are trying to push off Moscow's yoke. Dagestan, they're much, a much larger proportion of Dagestanis go to Saudi Arabia, they, they abide by Wahhabist ideals, and so one of the reasons why Basayev allied himself with this guy Khatab and moved into Dagestan, I think, and we have some evidence from interviews to support this, is that they had more resonance there, right? That the Wahhabist global ideas uh, were more resonant in Dagestan, and so it moved up. So again, Moscow sort of made a mistake because it was sort of a localized Chechen fight among Sufi brotherhoods who had control and, and, and were willing to keep it localized, killed off the moderates. Masharov was running to Moscow and saying, help. Help! This guy Basayev is bad news. It was Basayev who did the Beslan Max massacre, right? And Moscow said all Chechens are bad, all of them. I mean, that's the way they dealt with it. No nuance. Now, there's under Medvedev, they were trying to have a little bit more nuance. Um, so, in a sense, again, it was this dynamic, this interaction, intra-elite bargaining, outbidding among the elites. We saw it happening. The question is, is why religious? And you know that's one of the things I'm trying to get at, why religious? And I think there's something about the staying power, the sacralization of the conflict, and the willingness to get young men and women to sacrifice themselves and be rewarded for it. I, you know, I started my talk with that. I think that that is part of it. This is why they have the martyr letters. They're proud of what they're doing. It's why they take videos, right? And their family is going to be commended for having sacrificed their child you know, for the cause. So I'll stop there. Could, could I ask you, uh, none, I, I, as far as I know, none of you are Afghanistan experts, but maybe you, Monica, you've been working on Islam. Well, yeah. If you could uh, try and, and... My response to you is politics. I'm, Afghanistan, back to geography, it's located in a ter pla terrible place in the globe. Um, and you've got regional, you've got local dynamics where you have a, basically you have localized constituencies that want to be self-governing. Afghanistan doesn't do well under a centralized government. And then you have regional state players who basically see Afghanistan as part of their spheres of influence. And that's why you have Pakistan, the United States, Russia, the Soviet Union, India, right, and Iran, Turkey, all sort of mucking around in that area. Unfortunately, you know, pa Afghanistan is sort of what Poland was in the 18th century, and it's going to take more, more and more, you know, hundreds of years and enlightenment to say, okay, enough, that it's actually not in our interests to be mucking around, you know, currying favor with different groups within the state um, um, and uh, playing around with the local politics. I'm not optimistic about Afghanistan. But, but why Taliban and why so rapidly? What do you mean? So it wasn't that rapid. I mean, it took over, mm -hmm. what, at least a generation for the mm -hmm. Taliban to take over. And I agree with you. We do not know what kind of support the Taliban have. I mean, in my more crass moments, which are often, but I step back and I say, let the Taliban have Afghanistan. They will make such a hash of that place that the Afghans themselves will throw it off. This is what happened in Iraq. Al-Qaeda overstepped its hand. Remember the beheadings on TV? And then you had the Sunni awakening, and the sheikhs came, and they thought, oh, shit, we're in trouble, right? And they realized they were as strong as they were going to be. The Americans were talking about leaving. The Shia were willing still at that point to negotiate. And here we are today. Iraq you know, is independent you know, and that sort of thing. But in the case of the Taliban, I agree. It, it, chances are they do not have local support. Now, we understand that in some corners of Afghanistan, they did bring order. And people appreciated that. Women could walk the streets without fear of being 
you know, mauled, raped, or whatever it would be. Um, but on the other hand, I think you, you know, you give them enough time, they'll make enough. That it's got to be the local population that says, okay, enough, and throws them out. Because we can't do it. We don't have the intelligence, we don't have the staying power, the guts, um, the resources at this point uh, to be able to do it. I, I just want to respond. I mean, on, <clears throat> uh, on the Afghanistan case, uh, without being an expert at all in this case, I think the, the sort of the implications of, of, of the research that I've been doing is basically. I mean, one of the argument in Afghanistan right now is that you can't talk to religious militants. You can't engage in negotiations with religious militants. Uh, and I would question that and say that there are possibilities that through the through the. I mean. Uh, not sort of uncomplicated, but still possibilities that through the negotiation table reach agreements that could that could desacralize the, uh, the conflict, take religious out of the conflict. And in some way, what, what Monica is saying that to to give power to religious militants in some context and under some uh, some sort of uh, under some conditions can be a way of of giving them um, uh, to actually helping to moderate demands so some of the local taliban commanders that had have sort of when they got local control they were not able to implement the, the kind of sort of very strict implementation against music for instance they had to sort of start to moderate when once they got into power so power had a sort of a moderation effect in some sense Okay, uh, <coughs> we will have to, to finish up soon, but Should I would... more questions? Or I, we had originally said that we would end by three, and I think uh, that clock okay. is in people's body. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow, yeah. that is a... <laughs> so yeah. we oh, will... Okay. So, uh, we not have any so okay. last comments from Ragenhold. Okay. Brilliant. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think my responses actually are, are, are worthy of the ending this, this very up. interesting day. <laughs> um, no, yeah. uh, I think that uh, the discussion here and all the different elements that are brought up um, bodes well for the continuation of, of research on, on conflict. And I, I think that we, it's very interesting actually how from very different perspectives and, and backgrounds we can agree on certain things about how we need to sort of open up the black box of what is what is religion, what is, uh, what is religious conflict, maybe become even clearer in terms of who are we exactly talking about, what are the actors and the, the issues at stake. And there are, there are so many more dynamics here that we need to dig into more. So, and I think that uh, the comments that Scott had were also spoke to that, the different, the different hypotheses that he put out there in terms of why religion uh, appears important at certain times, why it comes in late in the game. Uh, there's both talk of a contagion effect about the group state dynamics, about intergroup competition, and also maybe intergroup uh, competition here. Um, a lot of the claims that have been made about the importance of religion are, uh, are starting their discussion from a, the perspective of the individual. When religion, when an individual acts based on religion, those individuals uh, behave differently from individuals that are, um, are motivated by something else. And so, so here we're looking at um, a large set of possible studies in the future, looking both at are th actually those individuals that go out and do uh, commit violence uh, for some sort of stated religious reason, behaving differently from those those individuals that are no, uh, not so religious? Uh, are those groups that claim to fight for religious um, uh, certain religious issues do they behave differently than others? Are there particular um, contexts in which religion becomes more or less important and so on? So um, I think that uh, we will see a lot of interesting, um, interesting discussions in the future in terms of taking apart this very difficult, big and complex um, problem and sort of parsing it out into smaller, smaller pieces that we can actually study in more in depth both in terms of how one conflict develops over time, over space, but also across uh, different uh, countries and conflicts. And so I think that we've had very good illustrations of that in, in the different talks today, and that was, that's been very, very interesting. Yes. Yeah, I was just thinking when I started studying religion before 9-11, <laughs> a 
different time I, as a historian of religion we would we would go on oh remember religion you you must not forget the religious element and now like 10 15 years later we're like oh no not too much not too much and uh, it is a new field basically mm -hmm. and it's a kind of uh, and i think this today's seminar is um uh, it's a good exercise basically in, in thinking about these terms thank you so much mm -hmm. very very interesting and thank you uh, for um, to the audience for coming here.